Since 2016, weather delays are more prevalent every summer. Now, some of you will have read that. What is most interesting, however, is that the statistics also appear to show that bad weather tends to take place at weekends. Now, I'll let you draw your own conclusion to that, but it looks like understaffing at weekends is being misclassified as weather delays. Now, this chart shows where the problems lie. And it's not just customers who are suffering unnecessarily. The environment is also suffering. ATC problems lead to increased emissions in Europe. A recent EU environment report found that network inefficiencies in 2017 were responsible for a massive 5.8% increase in CO2 emissions. Airspace inefficiencies means that airlines have to operate longer flights, sometimes up to 30% longer, with 27% increase in fuel burn. And because of the underlying ATC issues, uh, and that they remain unaddressed, airlines have to reroute and fly longer journeys, creating additional CO2 emissions. On the chart, you'll see the three uh, offenders. Uh, these are perennial. Uh, Marseille, uh, which has the lowest capacity uh, ever, in fact, this year, uh, due to resource issues. When we have issues in Marseille, when we have strikes in Marseille, nearly 50% of Welling's flights are affected. Karlsruhe, in the centre there, is the number one location for en route delays, responsible for 16% of all air traffic flow management delays in Europe. Now, for years, there has been an issue of understaffing uh, in Karlsruhe with insufficient air traffic controllers, and this continues today. And then Maastricht is the busiest airspace worldwide. It handles up to 80 flights per hour, which far outstrips any other ATC uh, centre. And this means that any issue that we encounter in um, uh, Maastricht will automatically lead to extra delays. And to put this into context, if I give you an example of an Iberia flight, and these, this is a real life example from Madrid to Florence. So during the Marseille air traffic control strikes, these flights are required to fly through Algerian and Tunisian airspace to avoid Marseille. And this means an additional 253 nautical miles, or almost 500 kilometres of extra flying, 37 minutes additional time in the air, 1.4 tonnes of fuel being burned unnecessarily, creating about 4.5 tonnes of additional CO2. Now, the European Commission and Member States must take immediate action to introduce EU's much-delayed seamless European airspace. Its redesign into an integrated air traffic control system would mean shorter routings and quicker journeys, lower costs, fewer emissions. And it would significantly reduce emissions. We estimate that you could see a 10% reduction or 18 million tonnes of CO2 being saved every year. The modernization of European airspace is both urgent and long overdue. We could do it tomorrow, yet politicians have been discussing this issue for over 18 years. It's now time for action. Christina. Thank you, Willie. We see on the next slide, because you talked about the structural issues that we have in, in the European airspace, which, which are as bad as they are, but we also, there are compounded by strikes and often we have very short-term strike action. Last year the majority of strikes uh, was in France, in Marseille, as you pointed out, often on the weekends without really having any idea of what is it that people want to stop the strikes and, uh, and really impacting uh, passengers flying on the weekend on holiday, um, which is not how you want to start your holiday. This year, unfortunately, um, you know, Belgium takes the cake. Uh, in a bad way, so it's not a good cake. Um, with uh, with strikes, uh, you know, having started uh, in February already, um, with uh, with a situation that lasts until today, with uncertainty even today for travelers, we see that travelers avoid also partly now Belgium, um, you know, flying from other parts, uh, you know, outside. So whether it's uh, it's flying from the Netherlands, from France, from Düsseldorf, these are things that that are not improving uh, efficiency and also ecology. If uh, if people take also delays, reroutings, because they cannot um, confide uh, that, that things will work out. 
um, this, these are monopoly providers, so there is no alternatives. And, uh, and this is why you see here, we had uh, just alone, uh, you know, this year for all A4E airlines, over 550 cancellations because of ATC strikes. We are not even talking about the delays. This is just the cancellations, often the action with very short notice. So you get a, a text uh, in the morning at 6.30 that from 9 o'clock the airspace will be closed. Obviously, the passengers are on en route and you have no options of, of what you will do. So what we're asking here is, uh, is also for these monopoly providers to look at it from the view of a customer and from the environment and, uh, and to at least you know, find other solutions, you know, give, uh, give, um, give leeway to other providers to help out. Uh, and to announce much more in advance. We see that with other strikes, as much as we hate those as well, uh, at least there is the decency to give much more advance notice so that other alternatives can be found. Here, we don't have that. And even sometimes what we know is a strike, like you said, with the bad weather, um, is said as people are sick when we know they're not sick. So, uh, so I think this is uh, what I would like to say uh, regarding, uh, regarding the cancellations and, and the effects of ATC strikes. On the other hand, as airlines, you know, I think um, it's our fate to be closest to the customer. We feel their pain the closest because we're the <laughs> immediate link, uh, meaning that, you know, we hurt and, and we feel the hurt of the passengers. And uh, we are trying our best to support, you know, by other measures, and I've brought an example from the Lufthansa group, but I have to say all airlines are really trying to mitigate the effects as much as we can, but you all know that if there is an airspace closure, like there was in Belgium on, on two occasions this year, <laughs> as an airline, there is nothing you can do. And, uh, and this is why we're saying it needs to be, uh, there need to be alternatives to monopoly providers and there need to be more reliability. In this year, um, in the Lufthansa Group, um, we are we are taking numerous measures in order to uh, to uh, to look at how can we compensate a little bit for for the ATC topics, you know, fueling during uh, during boarding so that uh, the plane can take off more rapidly, having additional um, aircraft uh, in reserve so that if there is uh, any issue or delays, we can then break um, the the waves of the aircraft and and you know one aircraft is delayed, another one takes off. Uh, with additional crew in order to to make up and to to not have a rotational delay as as we call it when the it's really the aircraft coming late and late and late and uh, and also putting additional staff whether it's mechanics whether it's in the service center to really uh, to really handle the disruptions that we see but obviously you know this is for this summer because we already knew it was going to be bad uh, a 250 million plus investment just on these measures and as you know, the airlines is not the most profitable industry, so this is obviously not sustainable and this is why we have to push for structural solutions in order to come again in a more healthy uh, economic <laughs> and, and also in um, ecological environment. Thomas. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Christina, and really, and um, of course, what you've heard from uh, Christina really is that clearly the confirmation again is that ATM is dysfunctional, still dysfunctional in the EU. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about um, what we are asking as a free uh, towards the regulators um, in terms of concrete action. It's actually with the new European Commission being shaped at the moment. I mean, you read all these sexy things in the press about uh, who's going to be the new Commission President, the, the Commission portfolios, the new European Parliament being composed. Uh, it's our job to make sure that they actually understand uh, these real problems affecting, affecting our, our passengers. So I would say it's an opportunity for the new European Commission, the new European Parliament, to finally start working on this dossier, which has been stuck for way too many years. When I talk about this dossier, it's of course the single European sky. So there's a real opportunity and the European Commission is pushing very hard. To move, uh, for, to move this dossier forward, a new uh, regulation forward. Um, with an update of this regulation, uh, we would be assured of, uh, which looks like a, a truly seamless cross-border airspace, which would enable us to fly more efficient routings. So it is, it is possible. We know exactly what needs to be done. Now the Commission needs to put it into a new regulation. You would also, uh, this new ruling or regulation, provide us with a more competitive service provision. And that's very important. You mentioned, uh, Christina, rightly so, the monopoly position. Um, so with a, a, a stronger regulation, um, it would remove our independence 
uh, as airlines on individual staffing requirements at the NSP level. In the absence of competition amongst the NSPs, because that is a, a possibility, unfortunately, it would actually still establish an independent economic regulator. So the European Commission is actually prepared and really pushing uh, to get this done. Even if it's at national level, we need economic, um, uh, independent economic regulators. The following slide um, summarizes a bit for you as well. As I said, we already have the tools which are needed to fix our inefficient airspace once and for all. All the stakeholders have been sitting around the table for the past 12 months, whether it's Eurocontrol, the airspace users, together with the European Commission. Um, so we know exactly what needs to be done. The proof of this is that uh, the Commission has uh, produced a European um, architecture study, which looks at things from mid to, uh, to long term, but also the Wise Persons Group report, which is very good taking stock of the actions that need to be taken with a very strict timeline. So we know exactly what needs to be done. So there's no excuse for the Council and the Member States to dwell around, sit around, while the Commission and we are pushing, and not to do anything. The Council, at the end of last year, uh, the European Council has recognised the problem. Uh, now they need to take action together with uh, the new uh, European Commission in uh, Q4 of uh, this year. We have done, as Willy and Christina also alluded to, as airlines what we can in order to not only support our passengers but also in terms of investing in people at our uh, air traffic control centres, operation centres. Now it's up to, to the politicians to invest time and to get uh, the ball rolling. Um, until then, we as airlines will continue to do our part uh, to minimize the impact, of course, of these inefficiencies and the impact on our passengers and the environment, which is, of course, a very important argument these days. <coughs> and as industry, we can only do us, uh, do us uh, so much. We need to address the root cause of the problem, just to summarize what said before, a quicker and more flexible deployment of air traffic controllers. Again, at the end of the day, the airlines are not the managers of the ANSPs. The ANSPs as suppliers are really failing. Uh, to provide a good service and an affordable cost. For this, we need to do the politicians to do their job now, uh, really push them, get appropriate funding and the right management at, uh, at the level of the NSPs to get the ball rolling. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thomas. And I would just add to that on the ATC, I think a point we haven't made yet is the airlines are obliged to pay compensation or right to care to our passengers when for these delays. You know, notionally, the legislation says we can recover those uh, costs from the ANSP providers, but in almost every EU country, the ANSP is protected or is immune from uh, legal action or prosecution. So not alone are we and our customers suffering these enormous and unjustified delays, but we're having to pay out huge amounts of money to in right to care and in some cases uh, compensation costs as a result of the failure, lamentable failure, of some of these ATC providers to just show up to work um, uh, on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, we also want to just touch briefly on aviation taxes. Uh, it is a one of the uh, sort of a, a, a contemporary topic at the moment. Much of it is hugely uh, biased and misinformed. I mean, I am disturbed every time I read, as recently as the Politico uh, um, article this week, aviation gets a free ride. Aviation in Europe does not get a free ride. Uh, we are uh, already, the A4E airlines last year paid over 5 billion euros, that's 5 billion euros, in uh, ETS, aviation and environmental taxes, either at European level or to our governments. Um, we are investing as a group of airlines, the European airlines, oh, almost 170 billion in new greener aircraft technology over the next 10 years. In the case of Ryanair, we've ordered more than 200 new Boeing 737 aircraft, which will reduce fuel consumption by 16%, reduce noise emissions by 40%. So we as an industry, not alone are we paying huge environmental taxes already, we're investing enormous sums of money to continue to reduce our impact on the environment and to be a, uh, provide, uh, deliver a more sustainable industry. And this is in the case of an industry which only accounts for 2% of CO2 emissions. Shipping accounts for between 4 and 5% of CO2 emissions, yet nobody runs newspaper arts going, oh, let's tax the ferries and the boats, because it's always tax the planes when we're already heavily taxed um, um, of our environmental. And to give you an example, I don't know, have we got the slide, the next slide? We, got, we, we, uh, we have. Ryanair, well, we've already released, for example, the taxes we're paying in the last 12 months. 
Uh, A4E has uh, assembled uh, all of our members in the last year, paid five billion. Of that five billion in 2018, Ryanair, which is one of Europe's largest airlines, paid 544 million, 544 million uh, in ETR, in ETS and environmental taxes. We paid 330 million to the British government in APD. We paid 88 million to the German a, a, German APD. We paid 5 million to Scandinavian APD, 5 million in Austrian APD, and we paid 115 million in ETS uh, payments to the EU. That came to 544 million last year in a year when we carried 140 million passengers. So the cost per passenger, that we paid a tax per passenger of almost four euros. Our average fare last year was 39 euros. So each passenger flying Ryanair is paying an environmental tax, or we're paying an environmental tax on their behalf, of over 10% of the ticket price. Last year, for example, our total fuel bill was 2 billion euros, yet we paid environmental ETS taxes of over 540 million. It's 25% rate of tax on our fuel. And yet we have to put up with these claims that aviation is getting a free ride and we're not paying our fair share of environmental taxes. We are paying on behalf of our customers, penal level of aviation taxes. And these taxes are continuing to rise. We saw the French government yesterday design a tax that will be imposed in 2020, which is yet another unjustified tax on air travel. And I think there's a real issue at a time when we in the airlines are focused on positive solutions. Taxes are not the solution. The taxes are regressive. And while there's an argument here in some of the Central European countries, the Dutch in particular believe taking the train is a, an attractive alternative flying. Yes, it may be. But if you live in an island like Ireland or Malta or Cyprus, you live in the peripheral members of the European Union, Portugal, Spain, the Baltic states, Poland, Romania, etc. You don't have trains as an alternative. We have no choice but to fly. And one of the four freedoms of the European Union was freedom of movement, and integrating or at least bringing the peripheral members up to the same level as the central states. These aviation taxes are regressive. They are bad for competition of the competitiveness of European transport. They damage the competitiveness of the Europe of the peripheral uh, countries and particularly the islands. The Irish government introduced a travel tax of 10 euros back in 2006. Within three years, air travel, the number of passenger journeys to and from Ireland had collapsed by a third went from 30 million to less than 20 million passengers in one year. Now, thankfully, the Irish government saw the error of their way about eight years ago or six years ago, scrapped the tax, and lo and behold, within, I think, about a four-year period, air travel has recovered from under 20 million to back over 30 million passengers a year. The islands and the peripheral countries of Europe cannot afford or sustain these environmental taxes that are damaging to the free movement of people and are damaging uh, to the development of the peripheral economies. Fuel taxes damage EU competitiveness and distort traffic flows. And remember, this is an industry that's already paying environmental taxes in the form of ETS. And we are shortly to uh, have the Corsia, which would be a double burden for the EU airlines imposed upon us. And yet, there are positive solutions. The airlines are investing, as I said, Europe's airlines are investing 170 million in new aircraft, new technology that will significantly improve fuel efficiency and reduce our carbon footprint. More efficient operations, we're designing more efficient operations, which could save 20 million tonnes, or have saved 20 million tonnes of emissions since 2014. And as Willie has pointed out, if the member states tackle just ATC inefficiency, this alone would further reduce our foot carbon footprint by 10%. It's a reform that's 20 years late, the single European sky. It still hasn't been delivered and it needs to be delivered now. We believe the EU and the member states should support sustainable measures uh, for uh, aviation uh, fuel research and supply. But we need effective reforms such as reform of ATC. Don't tax passengers don't tax particularly those passengers who live on islands or in the regions of Europe. And as far as, um, there, um, just to give you a sample of the other initiatives that the A4E members are taking on in terms of sustainability, as I said, Ryanair is purchasing 200 new aircraft over the next five years at a cost of more than $20 billion. It will reduce our fuel consumption by 16% per seat. IAG is investing 400 million in sustainable fuel development over the next 20 years. 
KLM, when they're not promoting train journeys, has committed to developing uh, our development and purchase of 75,000 tonnes of sustainable fuel each year for the next 10 years, starting in 2022. Lufthansa Group has set out a plan to become carbon neutral for ground operations in Germany, Austria and Switzerland by 2030. Air Baltic has an EGEN project enabling high precision approaches to cut CO2 emissions and EasyJet is actively parting with Wright Electric to develop an electric aircraft with the intention it will be viable for short haul routes in Europe by 2030. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe's airlines are at the leading edge of reducing fuel consumption and imp improving environmental sustainability. We call on the governments of Europe and particularly the new European Commission, work with us. Help us to solve the ATC screw-ups which are uh, causing such uh, delay, or da delays for our customers and damage to the European environment and stop this policy of double taxing or levying additional taxes on top of hard-pressed European air travel consumers and work with us as an industry to develop these sustainable and effective measures. Thank you. Thomas. Thank you very much. I'll pass on the word back to Jennifer for Q&A. would like to have the first question. Gentleman in the front. Uh, Tom, a question for Thomas. Uh, in March, you gave us a list of uh, actions that you'd like to see. Some of them sounded quite complex, like um, independent regulation of air traffic control, some less uh, so, uh, such as separation of upper airspace and mm -hmm. um, the strengthening of Europe control. Would you like to give us an update on how six or seven of those action points have progressed in the few months since last March? Where are you seeing progress? Where are you seeing no progress at all? Thank you for the question. Uh, very important question. I mentioned the Wise Persons uh, report um, and the architecture study. So the Wise Persons group report is actually taking up uh, most of um, our demands that we had uh, put forward. Um, and so we're very happy with that. Um, we uh, are finding ways now to try to find ways to work closely with Eurocontrol and the Commission as airspace users. Uh, because, of course, we are not an institution uh, and we need to make sure that we as airspace users have a role in the implementation of the measures. But the Wise Persons Group report is exactly saying many of most of the things that we, ha we have been uh, demanding. Um, and in the meantime, um, as you probably know, also, um, thanks to the pressure from A4E and, and other airspace users, uh, the Eurocontrol has actually taken uh, measures to mitigate the negative impact of the delays for this summer. Uh, now, of course, it all depends on the growth of the traffic, uh, but the expectation is that um, thanks to the pressure and, and the measures that Eurocontrol is taking as we speak, I mean, they've been going on for a couple of months now, is that we haven't seen um, delays that are so much, much worse than last summer. As bad as last summer, but it could have been much worse if they hadn't taken actually these these measures. So we're we're on a good track. It's it's just a question of it's all been documented, all been supported of the council, the member states, to actually give the mandate to the NSPs uh, to give them sufficient funding to actually move things. And I'm particularly thinking of two countries, France and Germany, where we see most of the problems. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to say that because of um, the cooperation between uh, the airport, air traffic control uh, provider, Eurocontrol and the airlines, the situation in Barcelona is improving. What we can't control, however, is uh, the impact that Marseille air traffic control strikes will have on Barcelona. And this is because of the proximity of Barcelona airport to the airspace controlled by Marseille. So where there is uh, issues that can be controlled, uh, they're actually working very well. And I think there's been great cooperation. Uh, the frustration, however, that everybody feels is that great cooperation is being undone when we see an air traffic control strike in Marseille. Because once you see air traffic control, uh, Marseille air, air traffic control closed, uh, over 50% of flights that leave Barcelona have to fly through Marseille airspace. Uh, and there's no way around that. You know, they either have to take an extremely long diversion uh, ar around France uh, or they have to um, just wait for the very significant delays. 
but uh, the situation is better this year and uh, the uh, impact of the uh, local issues have uh, significantly improved and I would expect that that will improve again uh, following the, the work that's being done by all of the people uh, who are coming together to try and improve the situation for customers at Barcelona Airport. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to respond. That's one of the uh, other misinformations. Uh, aviation is not one of the fastest growing emitters uh, of CO2. In actual fact, road transport is growing at three times the rate of aviation emissions just within the European Union. And bear in mind that no matter what Europe does, emissions in China and India will double between now and 2030. So no matter what we do in Europe, it is irrelevant compared to the growth in emissions. Now, that doesn't mean Europe shouldn't act, and we should. Uh, but for the growth, remember, if you take someone here like Ryanair, we're 30 years old. Uh, we, have, we this year will carry 150 million passengers. About half of that traffic is newly created traffic because of our very low fares. About another half of that traffic is traffic that has been switched from old legacy airlines, many of whom are no longer in business, like, you know, uh, who are flying old aircraft, uh, very inefficient old aircraft. So the actual fact, as an industry, yes, we're growing and we're carrying more passengers, but we're carrying those more passengers on much more efficient uh, aircraft, much more efficient engines, and we have invested very heavily over the last decade and into the next decade to continue to reduce. So emissions from, it is, untrue that emissions from aviation are one of the fastest growing sectors. Simply wrong. Um, it's also untrue that aviation is getting a free ride. It's simply wrong. We're one of the most heavily taxed, certainly uh, of the transport sectors, uh, compared to, uh, you know, the trains pay no environmental taxes, um, uh, nor do the ferries pay no environmental taxes. We do. Uh, just touching on Brexit, everybody has a different view. The Lord only knows what will happen uh, when Brexit comes around. Um, we still hope that there will be some common sense uh, prevail in the UK, uh, although there's precious little of it at the moment. Uh, we would like to see in some kind of form of negotiated deal that would uh, result in the least it disruption of consumers' lives in both the UK and in Europe. And we certainly, uh, A4E doesn't have a united position on Brexit, but we hope to see there are measures that have been put in place by both Europe and by the UK that would at least, I think, uh, prevent enormous disruption over the first uh, nine or 12 months. But after that, if there is a hard Brexit and there's no trade deal, there could well be severe disruptions, I think, particularly for... Uh, the, for airlines and our passengers. I'll ask Willie to give heed better insight because he's based in the UK. As, as an Irishman in the UK. Um, <laughs> yeah, allow me to address the issue of taxes. Uh, what, what we're strongly opposed to is taxation to address an environmental issue because taxation will not in any way improve the environment. Uh, you know, the industry has come together to support the emissions trading scheme globally, Corsia, uh, because this is where money physically goes into improving environmental performance, whether it's in uh, new technologies or, um, you know, providing a financial incentive to others to improve their environmental performance where we can't do it ourselves. As Michael says, we're investing billions 
as an industry in Europe to improve our performance investing in new aircraft and we're investing billions collectively in new technology, be it in the form of sustainable biofuels or in, uh, research and development into electric and hybrid electric uh, aircraft. And these are issues we're not competing on. You know, we're doing this because we want to see the industry improve. Taxation is not going to do anything to improve the environment. And these taxes are often uh, you know, put with environmental labels because governments want to abuse the environment. You know, to raise funds on the back of environment, to give an impression that they're doing something positive. You know, we would challenge governments, if you're raising these taxes to improve the environment, well then spend the money improving the environment. Don't spend it in, in other places. You know, so hypothecate the tax. They've always resisted doing that. And if you look at air passenger duty, so in the UK, uh, British Airways will pay almost, or l last year in fact, paid 850 million euros in air passenger duty. Not a single cent of that money went to improving the environment. Not one cent went to improving the environment. You know, this is money that could be used much more efficiently to improve the environmental performance. So you know, the issue of taxation is separate to uh, supporting improvements in the environment. We as an industry, as, M as Michael has outlined in his presentation, are doing a lot to improve our performance and will do more because we can see that there is opportunities. Every day we're seeing you know, the potential for new technology and new advances to improve our performance. In relation to Brexit, uh, you know, I share Michael's view. I don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, in the debate last night, both of the contenders for the leadership of the Conservative Party and future Prime Minister said that the UK will leave the EU on the 31st of October, but neither of them, I think, will be prepared to resign if that doesn't happen. So we'll, uh, we'll wait and see what happens. Second question, France, especially Air France <coughs> yesterday was criticizing especially the fact that the French government is not uh, planning to spend the income from the French aviation tax into aviation, but rather into the railways and other areas. So what, would you be easier to uh, comply or, or accept the taxes if they would be spent into aviation? Well, essentially the first part, yes, we're responsible for making flying uh, affordable for citizens all over Europe. It's one of the few economic successes that the European Union is able to point to. I mean, we campaigned in the Brexit referendum two years ago in the UK, and it was apart from low fare, air travel and roaming charges, what has Europe done for us? Here we have one of the great success stories. There's a big challenge facing Europe at the moment. It's called competitiveness and it's high youth unemployment in the regions. Now, if you want to get the 30% of Greek people under 25 back to work, eight Italians back to work, the Spanish back to work, tourism is the industry that's going to get these kids jobs. We all got our first job in a hotel, in a bar, in, a uh, in restaurants. Tourism is one of the ways of creating economic activity and much more importantly jobs for starter jobs for young people in the regions of Europe. It's fine, you know, and we, uh, we're, we applaud the Dutch because the Dutch do have an alternative. You can take the train, you can cycle around Amsterdam if you want. We don't in Ireland have the choice of taking the train. There's no other way of getting responsibly on and off the island of Ireland. We've tried. We don't, we're not particularly good at swimming. So, you know, by all, and I think Willie's made the point, and Christina has made the point. That's the reason, when you say fly responsibly, I mean, Ryanair is one of the greenest, cleanest airlines in Europe. Because we have one of the youngest fleets, the most fuel efficient, people are, by switching to kind of low fare airlines or to the airlines that are represented here who are investing billions of pounds in new technology, are already flying responsibly by, by flying with those airlines. We are investing very heavily on their behalf. They shouldn't be double taxed on top of that having already, uh, I think, made the decision to fly responsible by flying with British Airways, with Brussels Airlines, and in particular by flying with um, 
I don't know who wants to speak on behalf of the French mayor, Christine, you? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, almost France. <laughs> um, I, where I agree with you is that if taxes are levied, which we are not in favor of, then what we would like to see is investment of those things in of those taxes that are levied into making flying even more environmentally sustainable. And there we, like uh, like Willie pointed out, we don't really see the relationship between levying something and using it to making flying more sustainable. You know, and, and we're all talking about, you know, you talked about opening Europe, opening the globe, you know, giving chances to people. The first things that people want to do is to see the world, to meet other people. And I think it's our duty to make that available in a better way. But we need support for that, you know. I mean, the investment into eco-fuels, into uh, into other modes of uh, of, uh, of fueling an aircraft, into electrical aircraft. This is not something that, you know, somebody invents and it's there tomorrow. And needs means need to be done for that. And we see a lot of means going into green energy. Why don't we have enough means going into green flying? Kind of similar point, but but more about you know the impact on demand, um, just from you know this flying shame kind of movement. Um, if this is something that that airlines in Europe are getting worried about, whether you guys are seeing any kind of impact, um, when you were at the AIR to the AGM, and um, you know I think I'm probably right in saying that the, the environment took up more time there than I think it has, you know, ever maybe in in, in <coughs> at least in the, the most recent years. But I guess I guess the question is, you know. Like there's a there's a lot of what you're compa campaigning for in terms of taxes, in terms of um, you know new technologies, you know changing to the air traffic management systems, but none of that has changed in in recent years. And I guess what I'm asking is if there's this this kind of dueling pressure of this ramp up in public you know opinion about flying and about the environment versus you know the lag that has come from politicians and and the and you know what changes the industry can actually make around them. Yeah. <laughs> um. I, you know, I, I would uh, agree with you, you know, at the IATA AGM, a uh, considerable amount of time was talked about the environment. But actually, I, I would say for the past 10 years, at least in IATA, there's been a very significant focus on the environment. And I think IATA has been central in progressing the concept of a global solution to what is a global issue through the development of Corsia. And, uh, you know, we've got to remember, Aviation is still the only industry that has done that. We're the only industry that has come together to agree a scheme that would apply at a, an industry level. Nobody else has done that uh, as yet. Now, you know, there are people who say Corsia isn't enough, and for one, I would agree. Uh, you know, I think Corsia is a very good first step, and uh, I think everybody who was involved in the development and uh, the, uh, the arguments for Corsia recognize that, you know, it would evolve over time and that this would develop into a, uh, a better global uh, system. Um, we're not seeing any impact, and it is, you know, it's clearly Europe is, is not, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 it's, it's not seeing the same issues. Like, I think there's one green MP out of 650 in the UK. Uh, I'm not sure how many green TDs there are, uh, Michael, in, in Dáil Éireann, but there's, a, yeah, two. Uh, so, you know, we're not seeing the same push, because we recognise in these peripheral countries, particularly in countries like Ireland, an island economy, that without aviation, the economy would be destroyed. Uh, you know, Ireland depends on inward investment. Ireland depends heavily on US companies who invested in Ireland, and it depends on having air links, you know, to the US. And it's still a fact that 80% of the CO2 that is emitted from our industry is on flights of greater than 1,500 kilometers, where the train is not an alternative. So there are alternatives, and we recognize that. Uh, but I, I think we need to base this debate in, uh, in, in some facts. We need to uh, base it in reality. And you know, as Michael set out in his presentation, this view that uh, you know, we're not taxed and therefore we should face punitive action is untrue. Uh, you know, if, if I look at, um, you know, again, taking British Airways as an example, we say if we spend exactly the same amount per litre of fuel in taxes as the rail industry does. Uh, nobody says that the rail industry isn't taxed. Now, what we don't get, which the rail industry gets, is subsidies. 
So, so they're, they're getting subsidies from the UK government uh, in or around £6 billion a year, plus loans uh, to develop rail transport. You know, we're paying for our infrastructure, as you saw in the presentation across Europe, it's nearly 90% of our infrastructure costs is borne by the industry in the UK and Ireland, it's 100%. Uh, so the reality of it is here that this is an industry that recognises uh, uh, the role that it has to play and is playing a key role and is improving through significant investment, uh, both directly in new aircraft, as Michael has said, and in uh, research and development into sustainable alternatives to uh, kerosene, um, that we will uh, you know, play our part and improve our performance. And we can see a pathway to doing that. What we want is people to recognise both the economic impact that we have, which is absolutely critical to the European economy, and particularly, as Michael has pointed out, those countries on the periphery of Europe, uh, and also to recognise the, the work that we are uh, um, doing ourselves and funding ourselves, uh, which is unlike any other uh, mode of transport uh, ar around Europe or indeed around the world at the moment. Just one question. I would, uh, I would still like to add that, you know, because I think it is a little bit the zeitgeist in talk but we all offer voluntary ops offsetting uh, opportunities for our customers uh, online, and that is not going up. <coughs> you know, and I would expect that if people say it's such a big deal and they feel bad about it, that that would increase. So I still find that what people say, what people do, is not always the same thing. <coughs> Why, after 18 years, <coughs> this SES issue hasn't moved one inch forward? And do you really expect that the new commission will have a different view on it? Well, it's, uh, the European Commission has always had a very clear view on it. Uh, the European Commission here is not the problem. The European Commission is the architect of the single European sky. It's the member states that are a problem. And uh, if you dig, you don't have to dig that deep, but if you look at uh, countries like uh, France and Germany, you just scratch the surface and people get very nervous. Um, people talk about national interest and so on. And if you, um, even people with very good will, when you actually talk to uh, executive staff of these air navigation service providers, they still think in um, country borders, which I find very shocking. If you make a telephone call, I mean, I am oversimplifying, but you actually, when you make a call from here to your home country, you actually think like, oh, well, it's got to cross all these services and so on. No, it works. Uh, flying, passengers take it for granted that they fly across borders. It should be really cross-border. ANSPs, and including because they are monopolies, they have no incentive today to do better. Uh, and we pay them, as airlines, a lot of money for sometimes a lousy service. I'm not even talking about strikes, just the delays. The fact that uh, the problem in Karlsruhe, that the DFS is using shortage of stash, for me is an excuse, because it's not a new problem. It's a problem which has been going on for years, as you know, and al always comes up, oh yes, it takes two years, three years to train at cost that. We know that. Actually, I would be blunt, we're not interested. We're paying for a service, we want to have a good service at the right price. And that's, by the way, our passengers are paying for the service as well at the end of the day. It's just, and you know, it's not the only monopoly problem we have in our value chain. We can start talking about airports, that's not the subject of today, airports with significant market power. But clearly, in our value chain, we are, in our value chain, the only truly liberalized uh, player in aviation, you know, in addition to the OEMs. The rest, I mean, a couple of huge bottlenecks here which competition lawyers have always agreed in the Commission, we need to do something about it. But you need to have the agreement with some, with some, from some large member states that have important votes to move forward. So national interest at the end of the day still plays a role. So it's not the Commission, it's the member states that need to, need, need to get moving. That's a, that's a very good point. The same politicians that argue that a tax will do something about the environment are actually on the other side, their tax on the one side, and on the other side they, uh, they, block, they block decisions in Brussels. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. It is, it is, a, it is a, a nightmare. It doesn't make any sense. If you see how much, as uh, Michael and William have said, how much you can save up to 10% CO2 emissions per year just by having a more efficient European airspace, that's huge. 
Yeah, we will, and, and this is part of what we're doing today. And, and again, you've got to remember, we've invested billions in new aircraft equipment to enable us to fly anywhere. You know, so we have equipment on the aircraft today that uh, will, will allow us to fly from point A to point B without any reference to ground-based equipment. We're still flying airways that were designed in the 40s and the 50s when you had to use ground-based equipment for navigation. That's the scandal here, and it is a scandal. You know, that uh, the, the modern aircraft that we're operating, all of us operating today, uh, you know, the equipment that's on board that aircraft is light years ahead of the uh, airspace design. And, and we've spent the money in the belief and the expectation that the governments were going to deliver a single European sky, because they promised us they would. And they've been promising it for a long time. But you're absolutely right, it is a scandal that today we are emitting 10% uh, more emissions than we need to because of political inaction. You know, we said we could reduce it by 10%, 18 million tonnes of CO2 could be saved annually if we had a single European sky. And the technology exists. We're not waiting for some, you know, for some piece of magic to enable us to do it. It exists today, it could be done tomorrow if there was political will to do it. Well, uh, a more efficient European airspace means uh, better staffing. Uh, you need to have the right people to, um, to handle and to work with the new technologies. It's not only staffing issues, it's also interoperable technologies, to be honest. Uh, they need to be introduced, they need to be implemented. The funding is there. I mean, the NSPs are doing very well and they have, should have sufficient funding. Uh, and unfortunately, Cesar has been not successful enough to, uh, uh, to deploy uh, the technologies as they wished. Um, so I think that's also partly the failure from the uh, Cesar deployment manager to some extent, uh, which we've also um, always uh, also crit criticized. So it's the technology part, Luke, and, and the staffing part. One more question. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I would love to say there will be no delays, um, but what I can say is that for the first time, after the uh, difficulties that everybody encountered last year, uh, I think there's been recognition that we need to work together. Everybody, the airport, the airlines, the air traffic control providers, and that is happening. And I think we've got to give credit to uh, the government for facilitating the discussions, the airport for engaging the air traffic control providers, the airlines. So everybody is working to try and improve the situation for our customers. And, and that's a real positive development. As I said, what we can't control at Barcelona is when there are strikes at Marseille. And it, and it is scandalous, and this is why you know we have uh, made this claim uh, that you know the uh, French government in particular is failing in its duty uh, because you have a strike in France that is impacting on the free movement of people in Spain. You know that 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 is unacceptable. That that's to me is a breach of the principles of the EU. Uh, so we can't control that, unfortunately. But I, I am pleased to say that there is great cooperation between all of the people working at Barcelona to try and improve the situation. And we are seeing good progress. And I think some very good initiatives that will uh, assist in the improvement and the efficiency at Barcelona Airport. So there's one more question in the back. Oh, yeah. Have you had any meetings, either individually or as a group, with the, <coughs> with the flight chain movement, representatives of that movement? Uh, you don't really seem to be So no, we have not. We have not. Um, our focus as A4E is to inform um, the public, because I do agree. I think as a sector we should have done, and really is right to say that IATA and ATAC have been working, have been doing a lot of good work. I think what we uh, slightly fail to do as a sector is to, at ground-based level, explain in relative simple terms all the things that we're doing, because some of these things are very complex. Um, so that's what we focus on. Uh, and then our mission is then to convince 
the next with the next European Commission to convince the large public, so to speak, not only the stakeholders, the experts, because they know, they all agree with us, including the NGOs, I can tell you, about the arguments, but explaining in relatively simple terms all the good things that we are doing. That is the job for A4E going forward, and we take it very seriously. Can I just come back? Um, I disagree, you know, that we're not winning the argument. I mean, if you look across Europe today, traffic is still growing. We're carrying more and more people are flying. Now they're flying on more environmentally friendly and more environmentally sustainable aircraft. You know, I see very little support across, certainly in the island of Ireland, for the flight shame movement, because frankly, we have two choices. You can be shamed into flying or you're stuck on the island. And there ain't any other way off it. I met the Prime Minister in Malta a month ago, had exactly the same view. You know, we do need to do, and we need to continue to invest heavily on, to deliver sustainability. Um, and we're doing that as an industry. Um, but if you look at the continuing growth, and I come back, you know, one of the things that's lost in all of this is the lack of competitiveness of Europe, the lack of the, the high youth unemployment rates, particularly in the Mediterranean countries. They can't all be brain surgeons or they're not all going to be um, IT developers. So let's start with tourism because it's one way of creating jobs in those regions immediately. We are clearly today, as we've demonstrated today, we're sensitive to the kind of criticism that we're getting a free ride in the environment, because frankly, it's not true. Uh, and we have a very good case to push back against these uh, NGOs like the flight shame movement, because actually this is an industry that's performing remarkably well and meeting its obligations towards a greener, cleaner planet going, certainly in Europe, going forward. We have engaged uh, with a number of bodies. I've regularly shared panels, uh, particularly in the UK, and only uh, last week or the week before last, I was uh, on a panel debate uh, on environmental issues at the ACI Annual Congress, uh, which was held in Larnaca. And by the way, uh, I think everybody that attended that conference that wasn't living in Larnaca flew there. Um, because it's quite difficult to get there if you don't fly, you know. So there is a recognition that people often have to fly, uh, and you know that there's there's no shame in that. There's there, there should be no shame in uh, acknowledging that uh, you know there there sometimes are no alternatives. Uh, it's easy for people that have alternatives uh, to say that they can you know they can avoid flying, but for a lot of people around Europe, that alternative does not exist. Uh, and, and, you know, we're not, I'm not ashamed to be in this industry. In fact, I'm, I'm very proud to be in an industry that has hugely improved its performance over the years because it has recognised that it needs to play a part in addressing the environmental impact that we have. And I, I'm proud to be part of an industry that has come together as an industry uh, to lobby for a global scheme, Corsia, to recognise that you know this is a part of the solution to the issue, and that's costing us money. You know, we're, we're not trying to avoid uh, investment because we're actively investing. You know, we're actively spending money to improve our performance because we have an incentive to do so, uh, and and we're doing that all the time, and we're doing it more and more, and we're investing more and more in new technology to try and further improve the performance. So you know, this is an industry that has a good story to tell. We just want people who are uh, prepared to listen to understand the facts. And we recognize that are, there are some you know, who won't be prepared to listen and don't want to hear the, the facts about our, our performance because it doesn't suit them to hear the good work that is going on and the good work that will go on. And the acknowledgement that the industry uh, has uh, for the need to continue to invest to improve our performance. Okay, the last question. From the Catalan News Agency, just a doubt, uh, doubt about the Barcelona thing, uh, because I, I really don't know the, the, the competences on this, but you mentioned that the uh, government facilitated this cooperation, so I just wanted to know if it, you referred to the Spanish government or the Catalan government. It's both. It's both. And to be fair, by the way, the French government, there was a threatened strike in Marseille on the last weekend on the 5th of July. The French government did intervene effectively to avert that strike. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I'm, I should say as one of the, the one of the larger airlines operating to and from Barcelona, the situation in Barcelona is materially better this year than it was last year. And that's mainly because there's been fewer Marseille ATC strikes. 
and the French government, of whom generally I wouldn't be a great fan, has, deserves credit for, I think, the work they have done to avert. I think we've only had one weekend of strikes in, uh, in the month of May. Last year we had three. We had three in June, and so far I think in June this year we had none. But So there has been a significant improvement. Barcelona, though, is a very congested area. And when you do have short staffing, which recurs regularly in Marseille, particularly at weekends on Saturdays and Sundays during the summer period, <coughs> Barcelona gets uh, unfairly impacted. It is better than last year. It is still not at an acceptable level, but we as an industry, the Spanish, the Generalitat in Catalonia, and the French government, to be fair, are, and not, not least Eurocontrol, are working, you know, putting enormous effort into significantly improving um, the experience of passengers, uh, both flying from and to uh, Catalonia. There are no final questions. Thank you all for coming, and we invite you to stay and, and have a drink with us outside uh, for our A4E annual barbecue. Thank you again. Thank you to our CEOs for taking the time. Thank you.